following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Heaven, hell, and liberation are three fundamental terms that are used a lot in pretty much every religion. <clears throat> but of course, in Gnosis, we use these words a little bit differently than you might have experienced in the past. When we study Gnosis, we carry with us the uh, assumptions and definitions that we've acquired previously. And we've, when we study Gnosis, when we enter into trying to comprehend what Gnosis is, we have to go through a process of what's called uh, conceptual revision. And this is related with the third state of consciousness a process through which we review or revise or renew the concepts that we have in our psyche. And without this essential review, we can remain mistaken on really fundamental aspects of our own understanding of the path. So to understand what heaven, hell, and liberation really are, we have to review our own concepts of them and test them to make sure that the way we understand it refers to facts, that it's based in experienceable, experience, experiential reality, something that we ourselves have tasted or know, not just a belief, not just something that we have as a theory or as an idea, but something that we've experienced. This is, in fact, the, the starting point of Gnosis. And the word Gnosis refers to knowledge that we've derived from our own experience. And so we need to analyze the concepts we have in our own psyche about heaven, about hell, and about liberation, and test those concepts to see if our concepts relate to the facts, if those concepts are based in experience as opposed to theory or belief. So in order to do this sort of conceptual revision, we need to understand two things. The first one is that we have a consciousness, and consciousness is not mind. This distinction is very important, and to understand this distinction requires practical experience. To merely hear the idea or to study the theory of the consciousness is insufficient. The mere theory cannot 
show you directly in your experience what the consciousness actually is in you. So in Gnosis, we spend a lot of time in the lectures focusing on the consciousness itself, trying to point out and indicate clues that can help you to discover what the consciousness is in you. And this discovery cannot happen in a passive way or by accident. It can only happen when you actively search for it. And having found your consciousness, you actively work with it. When you enter into that active work of maintaining the presence and activity of the consciousness, you're then working with that third state of consciousness. And that third state is where the conceptual revision occurs. The third state of consciousness we call, in Greek, dianoia. And this refers to self-remembering, self-observation. Some people call it mindfulness or watchfulness. There are many names that refer to this state of consciousness. The second thing we need to know is where we are. to be present in the body, to be here and now. You see, these two things relate to each other, but oftentimes we don't work with both at the same time. Sometimes we may be trying to observe ourselves or work with the consciousness, but forget that we're here in the body. And so we can start to drift even in this state that we would call observation. That's why we separate self-observation from self-remembering. Because they are two functions of consciousness, which are related but distinct from each other. The, the remembrance of being present in the body roots us and grounds us to work where we need to work, which is where we are now not where we were or where we want to be, but where we are. So in synthesis, we need to remember that we're here in the physical body. And in the tree of life, this is called Malkut, which is a Hebrew word that means the kingdom. In other words, we need to be in our kingdom and to be in control of our kingdom to be the king or queen who rules that kingdom. And when we look to the tree of life, we see that Malkuth is the lowest of the ten spheres. But when we include in the graphic of the tree of life, the Kabbalah, the inferior worlds, we see that Malkuth is directly between the two. This is where we are. And this is why in the book of Jeremiah it says, Behold, I set before you a path to life and a path to death. Those doorways are here in this moment. They're not theoretical. They're not just ideas or something to believe in or contemplate as something abstract. They exist. And we continually walk through the door towards life or the door towards death in accordance with how we use our consciousness from moment to moment. So you can see that in Gnosis, we don't rely on theory. We're not interested in debate. We don't care for the comparing or comparisons or dialogue of mere intellectualism or dogma. We have no interest in this at all. Gnosis is a practical science, meaning it's something that we want to practice from moment to moment. 
It's something that we apply in order to arrive at our own experience of the facts. It's only by knowing the facts that real change can emerge. And this is what we want. We want change, real change. Not just a change of ideas, and not just a change of beliefs, but a change of our experience of life from moment to moment. This sort of change cannot emerge, cannot be created, merely by changing our beliefs. It cannot emerge merely by studying a new idea. And any one of us can demonstrate this fact for ourselves. Because all of us have had the experience of going through phases of life where we've discovered a new theory or a new belief, maybe a new religion, and become very enthusiastic and adopted that theory or belief and called it our own. And yet discover after some time that no real change ever occurred. That our fundamental problems remain the same. We suffer. We have uncertainty. We have doubt. We have questions that have not been answered. Important questions. Like, why am I here? We're not interested in vague theoretical questions that have no practical bearing on life. Like, when did life begin? Where did God come from? These things are not important right now. Maybe by the time we're self-realized, we need to know those things. And this is why Buddha Shakyamuni refused to answer these kinds of questions. He was approached many times by philosophers, by Brahmins, by yogis, who wanted to ask him these sorts of questions. And he remained silent. And this is because the teaching of the Buddha, like the teaching of Samael, is a teaching of practical importance. These great teachers understood that it makes no difference whether we believe God exists or does not exist, or that the Big Bang is true or false. It makes no difference. Either way, we still suffer in the same way. Not knowing who we are, not knowing why we're here, not knowing where we're going. These are really important questions to answer. And it is possible to answer them. We go through a period of life where, usually when we're uh, younger, where these questions burn us. And we need to know the answers. And so we study religion, philosophy. But yet, as many beliefs as we encounter, as many theories, all of which contradict each other, those questions are never satisfied. And eventually we may settle into accepting one belief or one theory. And yet, hidden inside, even though we'd never admit it to our companions in that religion or theory, those questions remain unanswered. And back in the back of our mind is this doubt and fear. What if it's wrong? What if it's not true? We're not interested in Gnosis, in providing you with another theory or belief that you can adopt and just accept. The Buddha was not interested in that. Neither was Jesus or Krishna. And this is why they stated, you have to test this for yourself. You have to do it yourself. Otherwise, there's no point. By remembering that we are a consciousness, by activating the consciousness and being present in our physical body, we initiate the possibility of answering these questions. That is, the consciousness needs to be active and awake. If the consciousness is not awake, we can never answer these questions. Why is that? It's because the consciousness is our true reality. It is our connection with our root, our source. And if we want to know 
where we came from or who we are, we have to look into the source of that. The root and source of our identity is not our personality. It's not in this terrestrial life. It's not from our parents or our country or our language. It's not from anything that we've gathered or gained here in the physical world. The consciousness is eternal. The consciousness does not die. Within it is our true patrimony, our inheritance from the divine. That is where we find the real information about who we are. When we look at the tree of life, the Kabbalah, we can see where the consciousness comes from. So here we are in our physical body, in Malkut. But the consciousness descends into us from the monad, which is the second triangle on the tree of life. Chesed, Gebra, Tifereth. The consciousness belongs to the monad and trickles down through the layers of matter and energy in order to become the active ingredient in the physical world. What should be the active ingredient. But unfortunately, we've not learned how to use it. And so it remains latent or asleep or passive in us. And what is active in us is our personality, beliefs, theories, a false sense of self. A sense of self that is illusion. It is maya. It is not real. We think it's real, but it's not. When we activate the consciousness, when we learn to use it from moment to moment, we establish this connection back to the monad, to our inner father, our inner God, the spirit. In Hindu terms, we would say Atman. In Buddhist terms, we would say Yidam. This is the inner divinity that represents our true nature and which we should become. If that channel or that conduit is not open and active, then we remain disconnected from our own inner divinity. And this is why now it's so common for us to feel a vacuum in our chest, a black emptiness in our heart that is so painful. It's like a, a vacuum, something that longs to be filled, but nothing in material life can fill it. We try. We try to fill it with money. We try to fill it with sex, with drugs, with music, with a career, with a family. But that emptiness, that vacuum in the heart can only be filled by God by the presence of our own innermost. When we have that, then we taste what heaven is. You see, heaven is a place, but we're not there. To enter heaven, we have to vibrate with that level of nature. In other words, our consciousness has to vibrate with that level of nature. It has to be connected. So if we look again at the Kabbalah and we see the physical world is Malkut, the third dimension. And upwards along the tree, we see an ascending scale or octave and every time we move up a note, things become less dense, more subtle, more pure, more beautiful, more real. When we reach the level of our innermost, this is the sixth dimension. 
This is related with nirvana. Heaven. Really, above Malkut, we see nine circles. And these nine circles are grouped in dimensions according to their relative degree of density. We always hear about nine heavens throughout the world. It's true in the indigenous religions and mysticism throughout the world. They talk about nine heavens. It's true in the Nordic traditions. Many traditions relate these nine heavens. Even in Dante's comedy, he relates about the nine heavens. Upwards from Malkut, we find them. Levels of more and more pleasant degrees, more and more beautiful levels of matter and energy. And these are real places. These are places that exist in matter and energy. They are places that our prophets and mystics have experienced and that any one of us can experience. And we may have already experienced it, maybe through a dream, maybe through being completely awake outside of our body. We may have experienced something so ecstatic, so beautiful that it's indescribable. That is heaven. That is nirvana. It's a level of nature. But it's a level of nature that's inaccessible to the physical senses. But it is accessible to the consciousness, if we know how to use it. If we activate the consciousness here, and work with it very persistently to free it from discursive qualities like anger and pride. That becomes a conduit through which we remain connected to our innermost. And then we can start to experience the feelings, the conscious qualities that belong to nirvana. And these qualities are simply humility, love, Patience, activity, abstinence, or um, not abstinence, what's the word for that? Chastity. These qualities or virtues are very beautiful, superior emotions that we can experience if the consciousness is active. But unfortunately in us, we're usually not activating the consciousness in this way. Usually, our consciousness is asleep. And we remain without any awareness of its existence. We even forget that we're in our physical body. And in most cases, we stumble along through life with this chatter constantly rolling along in our mind and constantly reacting to the diverse circumstances of life over which we have no control. This is why we don't know where we're going. This is why we suffer from so much anxiety and uncertainty. We don't know what will happen and we have a lot of fear about what will happen. And we have a lot of fear because we don't feel God within. And a lot of fear because we don't feel really connected to anyone else. We have a lot of fear because we don't know where we came from, or who we are, or what we're supposed to do with life, or what we're supposed to do today or tomorrow. What's the right thing? We don't know. We guess. And all that uncertainty and anxiety and fear is a stress. It is pain. It becomes doubt. It becomes skepticism. It becomes fanaticism. When our fear and our need and longing for security becomes so painful that we try to put a band-aid on it, a band-aid like religion. And this is when we adopt some religion or belief we join a group or a church who tells us a lot of beautiful things that if we believe 
If we follow the rules, we will go to heaven. If we just agree with this and that, and we, we uh, give a certain amount of money, or we give a certain amount of time, or we wear the right clothes, or we go and try and evangelize other people to join, whatever the steps may be, those things will guarantee our entrance into heaven. And because our fear is so strong, and our uncertainty and our lack of knowledge is so huge, we grasp these religions and ideas and beliefs. And many people make gnosis into that. Many people make gnosis into just another dogma. Just another system that they use to comfort themselves. To shore up their collapsing sense of self. Because really that's what's happening. When we become fanaticized to any political party or religious group or any theory or doctrine, including so-called atheism, People become fanatic in that way, very attached, because inside they cannot admit to the fact that their own sense of self is inadequate, and they know it. Their own sense of who they really are, what they're really doing, and where they're going is so weak and so fragile that they try to armor themselves with a belief or a theory. And don't just think it's other people who do this. We all do it. We all utilize group membership, ideas, beliefs, beautiful statements, associations with certain people, with country, with family, in order to project an image of who we are. Because we feel that by projecting that image, we make it real. That if other people see us that way, we will see ourselves that way. And that's really what we want. We want others to confirm what we mistakenly believe about ourselves. We want others to see us as well-dressed, well-spoken, well-educated, with the inside track to enlightenment or liberation. We want others to see us as having the secret clue to success in life. We want others to see us as humble, as a master, as a prophet, or simply sometimes to see us with envy. It's true. We want others to want to be like us. We want others to want what we have. And this is why we show what we think we have. So that other people will say, oh, I want that too. I want to be like her. I want to be like him. I wish I was that good looking. I wish I was that on top of it. I wish I was that strong, that together. We all project this. But it's all a lie. It's not sincere. It isn't genuine. It is a hundred percent false personality. It has nothing to do with the facts. This emerges because we don't see ourselves as we truly are. We want to see ourselves as we are not. We cannot face the facts of who we are and what we have become. Because of that, we run away from gnosis, which is real knowledge. We run away from the mirror that will show us our true face. Our true face is grotesque. Samael and Vior repeated many times 
that if we could see ourselves in a full-length mirror as we truly are, we would go mad. And this is true. People who become serious about studying themselves and using the keys that Gnosis provides arrive soon at that vision. That vision is called the guardian of the threshold. And that is a vision in which we see what we really are psychologically. And it is not that humble, sweet, generous, kind, patient person that we like to imagine that we are. It is, in fact, symbolized in a book. Several books, actually. The first one that comes to my mind is Frankenstein. Frankenstein contains glimmers of initiatic knowledge. Frankenstein is a creation created from dead things, illuminated by a diabolical intellect, the mind of a criminal, a liar, a deceiver, Satan. And that is what we really are inside. But we don't want to face it. Another book that illustrates this is The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde, in which... Dorian Gray has a mirror that helps him to hide his true nature and helps him to project a false image of himself. We can test this for ourselves to see if it's true. But to do that, we have to remember those two things I mentioned in the beginning. To remember we have a consciousness and activate that. And to remember that we're here in the body to be present. After some practice with these remembrances, we put ourselves in a position to be able to observe and be watchful of what actually happens in our psyche from moment to moment. In other words, we start to separate the consciousness from the personality. Rather than having the personality be so actively projecting a false image, we make that personality passive. We make the consciousness active, which is watchful, observant, not projecting, but receiving. Not pushing images out and trying to manipulate our inner and outer environment to have a given appearance, but to instead receive and perceive our inner and outer environment as they are, without changing anything, but to see them as they truly exist. When we arrive to that skill, because it is a skill, we start to see the facts of who we really are. Until we do this, we cannot see it because the personality will not let us. It's not in its nature. It's not built for it. Only the consciousness can show us what we really are. And this is a very important point because some of us have a personality that likes to beat up on ourselves. We have a personality built on shame or self-deprecation. This is not the way to see oneself. Some of us have a personality built on pride that likes to project a beautiful image. But for the one who has a personality built on shame, we like to project an image of a martyr. We like to project the image of the suffering one, the one who no one understands the one who's been betrayed and wronged time and time again, the one who never had a chance or an opportunity because it was always denied us. Many of us have that kind of personality. 
and we beat on ourselves and we have a lot of self-pity. Our personality has to become passive. In other words, we have to stop thinking that we are such and such a person with a certain name, that we're from a certain place, that we have a certain education, we have certain qualities or skills. We have to forget all of that stuff and learn to see things without any filter at all. To learn to perceive without glasses, without mirrors, without refraction or reflection, but to see purely. And only the consciousness can do that. The ego is a filter. The personality is a filter. Belief is a filter. Theory is a filter. Country, name, history, family, religion, belief, political groups, these are all filters which color and manipulate images. When this skill is developed to see ourselves as we really are, to observe our kingdom as it actually exists from moment to moment. This is a disturbing experience. Always. It is not pleasant. And I warn you of this now. Because that activity... That process of seeing ourselves as we truly are is symbolized in many mythologies as the descent into hell. This is what the Divine Comedy is all about. This is what the descent of Orpheus into hell is all about. And the descent of Heracles is all about. We have to see what we are on the hidden side of things. The side we've never shown ourselves and never shown anyone else. Because that is our true reality. By observing ourselves here and now, and seeing how we are in our inner relationships with others, we start to see that we don't really have the qualities we like to tell ourselves that we have. We like to think we're humble or patient very giving, very concerned about other people, very virtuous in this way or that way. But when we really start to watch what is in our psyche, we start to see that that's all a lie that we tell ourselves and that we like to tell others. And the reality is, from moment to moment, we are completely self-absorbed. completely self-identified. We are narcissists. Narcissists. Fascinated with our own false image. Hypnotized. Asleep. Dreaming. Dreaming a dream that does not exist. And so when we have conversations with a loved one, we see ourselves acting very patient or very loving while inside we feel very irritated. This is insincere. We see ourselves talking with our boss and we act very humble and agreeable, but inside, we're rebellious and angry and proud. It's the perception of these inner contradictions that can shock us right out of Gnosis. This is the number one reason most people leave this kind of teaching. Because they cannot face the facts of who they really are. This is why. So I'm preparing you for that. If you haven't had that experience yet, you will be ready because it is not easy. What happens in these moments when we start to see these contradictions in our behavior 
and in the contents of our psyche is we start seeing where we really exist in life. We start seeing where we really are. This is what we want, right? We want knowledge. We want to know who we are, but we don't want to see it. It's up to us to have the courage and persistence to see it for what it is. In other words, in these types of experiences where we're interacting with other people, where we thought we were humble, we're actually really arrogant. And where we thought we were being very loving and sweet, we were being very selfish. There are too many examples to name. And every one of us will have our own flavor. And this is why we have to find it ourselves. This is why it's impossible to write a detailed guide of, look for this ego acting like this. It's impossible. It would be trying to catalog every atom that exists. You cannot. You have your own psychological kingdom. And you don't even know what's in it. This is what we have to learn. What is in our kingdom? What constitutes our kingdom? Who's in charge of our kingdom? Who sits on the throne? There should be a divine king there. Our innermost, the magician, the magi, the king, who, who should be sitting on that throne related to the pineal gland, related to the heart, who guides the kingdom according to divine will, divine law, harmony with the universe, Tao. But unfortunately, when we sincerely begin to analyze how we behave, we start to see that that king, nobody's listening to that king. Everybody in the kingdom is listening instead to somebody else, and we don't see his face. And we need to see that face. And we can only see that face if we're strong enough to look in the mirror. That mirror is the consciousness, which will reflect the contents of our psyche if we use it. But for that mirror to reflect those contents, it has to be polished. We cannot polish our inner mirror, our psychological mirror, through simple self-observation. We polish our inner psychological mirror through meditation. Meditation cannot be emphasized enough. It is the heart and soul of liberation. Meditation is not the repetition of a mantra. It is not concentration on any symbol or sound or image. Meditation in itself is the pure, unobstructed perception of consciousness. This is the pure form of meditation without any artifice at all. True meditation is the full flowering of all the capacities that the consciousness has without any outside effect or influence. Meditation in itself, in its heart, is pure, unfiltered perception. Now here's a concept that we all have that needs to be revised. We have this image because of advertising that meditation is sitting in a lotus posture with our fingers curled up in a certain way. This is a lie. This is simple marketing. And it's a lie. 
Meditation has nothing to do with the body. Did you hear that? It has nothing to do with the body. Zero. But unfortunately, we have these ideas that in order to meditate, you have to sit a certain way. No. The true meditator is meditating at every instant of life without stopping in every activity. Because meditation is an activity of consciousness, not body, not belief, not thought. Consciousness. This is why it's repeated again and again and again. True meditation is beyond the body, beyond feelings, beyond thoughts. It is an activity of consciousness, pure perception. When that is understood through our experience, then we've understood something very, very important. Something so precious, it's worth more than any possession you can ever acquire in the physical world. It's worth more than diamonds or gold. Because that function of consciousness is the doorway to heaven. The doorway to nirvana. The doorway to liberation. You see, when we begin to really perceive our contradictions, and we start to get glimmers of the submerged tendencies in our mind, tendencies like anger, pride, lust, envy. When we start to see that these qualities are real in us, that we experience them, that they filter our experience, that they make us suffer, then naturally we want to change that. We need to change that. First thing is we have to see it. We need to observe ourselves and remember ourselves. Be active as a consciousness. Start to see how we suffer. And once we start seeing how we suffer, we start longing for a cure to want to change that suffering. The first thing is we have to see it. If we don't even see our illness, the disease that is killing us, we can't cure it. We have to see it first. We have to diagnose it. That disease is called hell. That disease is called the ego. The seven capital sins. Samskaras. Many names for this thing or collection of things. These cages that trap our consciousness and keep us in so much pain. You see, when we really start to observe the facts of our existence, we start to see that we already live in hell. We do. Because hell is not a place physically. Hell is psychological. And psychologically, we are in hell. Spiritually, we are in hell. What is the classical definition of hell? Suffering. Right? In every religion throughout the world, what is hell? It is suffering. Sometimes it's by fire. Sometimes it's by ice. Sometimes it's with, symbolized by demons persecuting the soul. Who are those demons? Our egos. Who persecutes us during the day? 
from moment to moment in our life our own anger, our own desire. We long to have a nice new car, but we can't afford it. And we feel pain because of that. We long for more money, but we can't get it, so we feel pain. We long to be healthy, but we can't get it because we have karma. We long to be respected, but we are not, and we suffer. All those sufferings that we experience emerge from inside of us, not outside. When someone says a bad thing to us, a critical thing, a hurtful thing, it isn't them that hurt us, and it's not the words that hurt us. It's our interpretation. Because you know if you're a parent, if your son or daughter says, I hate you, or you're stupid, we say, whatever. We laugh. But if our friend says it, or our neighbor says it, we become furious. Why? The words are the same. The only difference is how we interpret them. The hell of that furious anger is self-produced. Likewise, any discursive emotion, any disturbing feeling emerges inside, not outside. This means that hell is inside, not outside. At the same time, we can probably find moments in our life where we experience something so beautiful, so subtle, so indescribable that we remember it and long for it. And it may be something that you can't even put into words, like a sunset or a memory from childhood when you were just running in a field and you felt that pure, simple happiness of innocence. Or it may be the moment when you truly gave from your heart to someone else and they were so grateful and it was so sincere that it moved your very soul. You see, that experience, that feeling came from inside. That feeling is a taste of nirvana, heaven. So both heaven and hell, samsara and nirvana, are psychological. They emerge from inside of us. So do we want to enter heaven? Do we want out of hell? Of course. We all do. None of us want to suffer. We all want to be happy. We all want to be liberated from pain. But the problem is that we have this idea that liberation will only happen later, after death, or after we've made enough promises to our church, or given them enough money, or jumped over enough bars or been through enough hoops so that then the leader says, okay, I bless you. You're going to heaven now. This is not the entrance to heaven. It's not outside. It's not because of any person, any church, any religion, any book, theory, master, teacher, none of that. The door is in yourself. And the door is through your own action. Notice this is practical. The Buddha said, abandon harmful action. Adopt virtuous action. Tame your mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Simple. You don't have to believe anyone. You don't have to pay anyone. You have to change how you behave. And you can only change that when you see it. Having seen it, having started to become very familiar, to have the 
your own direct conscious perceptive experience of the contents of your own mind, then you can change it. You can't change what you cannot see. If you experience pain, if you experience anxiety or fear or suffering psychologically in any way, you cannot change that by changing external factors. You're just putting different band-aids over the same wound. And all of us try this. We try a different job. We try a different spouse. We try a different religion. We try a different city, a different country. Right? Always trying to change the external things to fix the internal problems. Doesn't work like that. The Buddha also said, if you want to untie a knot, first you have to see how it was tied. We need to look into the knot in our heart. The knot in our mind. The knot which is our own psyche. Then when we see ourselves at work going through the pain, psychological pain, of being at work, we can start to analyze perception, through perception, where is this pain coming from and why? And why do I react this way? Why do I justify my behavior? We have to realize that every single thing that we do, physically, emotionally, mentally, is a manipulation of energy. And every manipulation of energy produces a result. This is a law throughout nature. There is not a single level of nature that is free from this law. Even Einstein showed it. Energy and matter are transmutable. They can never be destroyed. They can only change from one to the other. In other words, your mental energy produces a consequence, sometimes in matter, sometimes in energy. But that energy has an effect. It has a consequence. Thus, when you feel angry, what are the consequences of that anger? The first one, you taste it immediately. It's painful. Anger is a form of suffering. But so is pride. Do you ever wonder why you feel separate from others? It's because of pride. Because we inflate our sense of self and we become self-identified, we ourselves produce the separation from others as seeing ourselves as better or different. That is self-imposed pain. So is anger. Anger wants others to suffer because we have suffered. Anger wants revenge, vengeance, recognition, payback. That's all selfish. And it can only result in pain. Anger can never bring happiness. Ever. It cannot. Neither can pride. Neither can lust. We have the idea that lust can bring happiness. And it can bring pleasant sensation. But we don't see that those sensations exist in a pendulum of energy. And the more we push to have pleasant sensations, the more that pendulum swings back to painful ones. The pendulum of craving and aversion. We set that into motion. So in this way, we have to analyze all our behavior looking for cause and effect, the facts. When I did this and that, then this happened. When I did this and that, then this happened. We've never done that. We've never looked at our own actions in this way. Instead, when we look at our actions, we justify. Well, when I did this, it was because I had the right. I was justified. Because he did this and she did that, and I deserved it. Self-deceit. 
We lie to ourselves constantly. And this is the worst form of deception that exists in the world. Self-deception. And every one of us is guilty of that. So when we initiate this investigation of what's in our own hell, we start to acquire a lot of facts. Disturbing facts. Painful facts. But we need to know these things. Why? Because of karma. Because of the facts of existence. You see, our consciousness is trapped inside of those elements. That's why we suffer with them. When we are suffering from the pain of envy, of longing what someone else has, and we feel that pain of wishing we had that, we created that envy by investing our energy into it. That's a consequence of identification, sleep, dreaming, fantasizing, daydreaming, creates ego, desire. And when we create those desires, we suffer inside of them. The consciousness is trapped there. In other words, the wife of Orpheus is trapped in hell. Helen is trapped in Troy. The beauty of the soul is asleep. Sleeping beauty. Put to sleep by that apple of desire. Created by the witch Lilith. Our consciousness, Gebera, sleeps in Klipoth and suffers. This is what we want liberation from. This is not just an idea. This is not just a theory. Every one of us is experiencing this. Our consciousness, the only beautiful thing that we have, the only pure element, the only, the greatest beauty in the world, as they described Helen of Troy. Helen is Beatrice of, of Dante. And Beatrice was that beautiful, beautiful woman that Dante was longing to be united with. Beatrice is the same, the divine soul, part of our consciousness, who's become trapped, imprisoned, captured by the enemy, hidden away in the domain of Pluto, Hades. If you know any mythology, you know this story. And this story in every world tradition is illustrating a practical reality that is psychological. And that is our reality. But in every case, there is a way to liberation. And that is through the action of Tiferet. Tiferet is the knight, the warrior, the human soul, willpower. This is Orpheus, Perseus, Theseus, Dante. These great heroes who have to be very courageous and descend into hell in order to redeem the soul. In other words, the hero can't go to heaven. Because the soul is trapped in hell. Orpheus can't leave his wife in hell. He loves her. He needs her to be united with her. So he has to save her. And that is what we have to do, to extract our consciousness from the ego, from klipoth. Klipoth is a Hebrew word which means shells. And it refers to those false creations of egos, which are like bottles or shells, things that we made that our consciousness is trapped inside. We need to go down there and break all of those to clean the stable as Heracles did, to save the beauty that we have within. The way this is accomplished is that, first of all, Tifereth, which is where our consciousness emerges from, 
has to get to know hell, has to know how to navigate it. And Tifret needs weapons, needs armament, needs protection. Hell is not an easy place to go. It is very dangerous. And that's why Gnosis is called the path of the razor's edge. It is very dangerous. Not from outside. Not because of us as teachers or instructors or students. Gnosis doesn't present a threat to you physically. The threat is inside of you. The threat is your own mind. The great threat is not whether we're lying to you or we're telling you a bunch of garbage or we want your money or anything like that. The threat is how you yourself will use this knowledge. Knowledge is dangerous. Knowledge is power. And to descend into hell is a risky business, but inescapable, unavoidable. The human soul gets its weapons, its power, its guidance from the Divine Mother. From something deep within us, which is called Hera, Athena, Minerva, Coatlicue, uh, Rhea, Sarasvati, Tara, many names for the Divine Mother. <clears throat> Remember in the Greek myths, Athena provides Perseus and Theseus with weapons. Athena is the one who guides Odysseus. Athena is the one who guides the, uh, the Trojan War for the redemption of Helen. Athena is the Divine Mother. And what is her sacred symbol? A serpent. This is also Durga, whose symbol is also a serpent. The weapons that the human soul needs relate to how we use the consciousness. If we descend into hell, like we are, naked, unarmed, innocent, foolish, the demons will consume us, our own demons. And we see this in many cases with people who learn powerful knowledge like this and become seduced by their own pride and start proclaiming themselves to be great masters or prophets. We see people who become seduced by their own fear and become vigorously opposed to that teaching that they once thought was so beautiful. This is how the human soul loses its way in its own abyss, diverted by its own ego, fear, pride, envy, jealousy, anger. Yet if we rely on our Divine Mother, she can provide us with protection and weapons. But only if we do our part. Those armaments are related with the solar bodies, but they're also related to meditation. It is the single greatest power that one can have to know how to use the consciousness without any artifice. Meditation is the power of the consciousness to actively, consciously, and awake enter into any region of existence and not be distracted, not be seduced, not be misled. If you don't learn that skill, then you face a tremendous, insurmountable problem. Because when you descend into your own abyss and start facing the facts of your own existence psychically, you'll start to face elements of pride and fear and anxiety and hate and lust that you have no clue about now physically because they are so submerged in your own mind. I'll give you an example of someone who failed in this regard. And we all know his name, Hitler. Hitler was an initiate of Gnosis who was studying with an occult group in Germany. 
and receiving the doctrine. But because he did not develop the proper skills of discrimination, he became misled by his own ego. And you can see the result. And if you know anything about his life, you know he started out as a loser. Someone on the fringes of society. But when he was given the power of knowledge, he was not given the power of discrimination. That's the key. That same potential exists in each one of us to make the same mistake. Now, he always believed he was doing right. And that's the great danger. When we descend into this level, we face things that are very, very subtle and difficult. But let me tell you something. You cannot avoid it. The fact is that our consciousness vibrates at that level. We can prove this to ourselves. What is our experience of life? Are we experiencing nirvana, heaven, from moment to moment? Are we experiencing bliss continually? Are we in constant samadhi? Are we perceiving the angels, the gods, all the time, physically? No. All we see is filth and suffering and pain. All we see is uncertainty and doubt and anxiety. When we close our eyes, we see darkness. When we go to sleep, we see nothing. And what we do remember is usually very vague, incoherent, or outright disturbing. That is where we exist, in fact, in the darkness of Klipop. I, st I stated earlier that some of us may have had some experience of a dream that is memorable, something related with heaven. We probably only remember one, maybe two, a small little thing. But if I said, have you ever had a nightmare? <laughs> All of us will say, oh yeah. Even if we don't like thinking about it, if we start really reflecting, we'll remember a lot of nightmares. Why? Because those belong to Klipov. A nightmare is the direct perception of what exists within our own mind, in hell, in us. A nightmare is real. It's not an illusion. When you're in a nightmare, it isn't an illusion. It's real. That monster that's chasing you, that devil that's coming after you, that beast, that threat, that danger, the violence, you don't experience that in a nightmare as an illusion. You experience it as real because in that level, it is. And that is our reality, psychologically, because our consciousness is trapped in hell. This does not change when we die. The physical body is just a garment that we will discard. The consciousness is eternal. It does not die. The consciousness will exist according to its level of being, according to its vibration. And if we observe ourselves from day to day and from night to night, we will see our level of being. That is where we live. That is where we belong. Right now, we're in hell. You can't change that with a belief. However beautiful a religion might be, belief in that religion will not save you. Belief in any outside force will not save you. And you can prove that right now. Start believing in something. You can right now say, I accept Jesus as my Savior and I believe, so I'm going to heaven. Your, your experience of life will remain the same. You might encounter new people. You might go to a different church. But you will be suffering all the same problems and maybe more. We need facts. We need things that we can experience, things that we can change ourselves. And where is that possible? 
in the mind. We can't change other people. Who among us has ever changed another person? And who has ever changed us? If we've ever changed, it's because we wanted to. Because we did it. The possibility to change is in the mind, not in circumstances, not in our situation. These are superficial. And the problem is, if we keep trying to change the outside things and trying to add new beliefs and theories to our personality, we leave our fundamental factual reality unchanged, which is that the consciousness is trapped in pride, in lust, in fear, in envy. And when we die, we remain in the same situation, just without a physical body. In other words, when the physical body dies, our consciousness, which belongs in hell, will go to hell. Simple. It's a law of nature. We go where we belong. Everything in nature goes into its proper place. If we want liberation from hell, we can't wait until later. How, how long are you going to live? Any of us know? Have you got like a date in your calendar? Well, I've got at least another 10 years. No. Not one of us knows the hour, the moment. But we all should get real familiar with the fact that we will die. This is another thing we like to put to the side and not think about. We will die. Face it. And this is why in the Lamrim, which is the, the graded stages of the path as taught in Tibetan Buddhism, the very first thing that you start to do is meditate on death the inevitability of death. Because until you've comprehended that, you will be entertaining all kinds of illusions. But the comprehension, meaning the experience, the conscious understanding of the reality and inevitability of death will clarify so many illusions we have about ourselves. If you really meditate on that, meditate on the fact that you will die. You will stop behaving the way you have been. I promise you. That simple thing alone can totally change the way you live your life. Because then, you start doing something dumb, you'll realize, oh, you know what? I don't have time for this. This stupid thing that I've been doing and wasting time on. I don't have time for that anymore. I have to get myself out of this situation. No one can do it but you. So if we do that from moment to moment, we start changing our actions and behaviors from moment to moment. We can start creating a new reality. And this is why the Buddhist teaching says, stop harmful action. It's the first step. And, and Gnosis, this is death, the factor of death. To die to all those foolish, useless behaviors. This includes all kinds of stuff that we've invested so much time and energy in that are a complete waste of time and energy. And I would suggest a few things that you can look at. TV, movies, magazines, a lot of music, a lot of friends, a lot of family stuff. Many things that we get ourselves wrapped up in that are a complete distraction from the fact. And that's usually why we do them. We usually do all these things because they distract us from our pain. Which means we're avoiding the truth. The next thing we have to do is to start adopting virtuous action, to start doing things that are important. And I would suggest as a first step, 
to start learning how to be aware of yourself. To comprehend what self-observation and self-remembering really mean. And to do that, you have to study. You have to make effort. Once you've started doing that, learn how to meditate. <coughs> From my personal experience and my personal opinion, I would tell you there is no more valuable activity on the face of the planet. In fact, the Buddha said, to enter into contemplation, meditation, for a single instant is more valuable than thousands of years of prayer. He said something else like, to enter into contemplation or meditation for the amount of time it takes for an ant to cross from one end to your nose to the other one will produce more results than thousands of years of prayer or a thousand gifts given in charity. That's how powerful real meditation is. And the reason is, it is an experience that is beyond your personality. It is beyond your sense of self. It is beyond your mind. It is beyond your physical body. It is something that you yourself can taste and experience that will transform you like a lightning bolt. You will not be the same. But to acquire that experience is entirely up to you. That experience is part of the protection and weaponry that the Divine Mother provides us in order to successfully make our journey through our own hell. The third step, or the second step that I mentioned is to adopt virtuous action. This means that in those moments observing ourselves and we see our inner contradiction, we have to start changing our behavior to behave sincerely and for the benefit of everyone, not just for our self-interest, but to start showing and learning about and manifesting true virtue, which there is no self in that. True virtue belongs to the being, to God. And it is how to be unselfishly loving, unselfishly humble, unselfishly active. Because one of the virtues is activity, the opposite of laziness. To not be gluttonous, but to instead have restraint. To not be greedy, but to instead be generous. And this is something we have to apply in our daily life from moment to moment. It's not just something we tell ourselves, okay, now I'm going to try and be a good person. I'm going to try to not be angry and be, be uh, very loving, very patient. That's fine. You can tell yourself that. But what you really need to do is do it. So when you are experiencing anger, you have to learn to transform that moment by will into love. To be loving towards the person that makes you angry is not easy. Because we're so attached and accustomed to our anger, we'd rather keep our anger. We know it. We don't know how to be really loving, to restrain anger. We don't know how to restrain lust and to be in chastity. Or to restrain envy and to be happy for others. If our friend, our coworker, gets a raise or gets a big promotion, normally we would feel envious. I deserve that, not them. We might tell them, oh, congratulations, congratulations, you deserve it. But in our heart, we're burning. How do you tell them congratulations sincerely? That is not easy. And the only way you can do it is to comprehend that situation. You can't fake your way through it. Comprehension is a quality of consciousness. It is understanding. Comprehension is understanding. Bina, the Holy Spirit, the Divine Mother. She can give us that if we enter her domain, which is in meditation. 
when we meditate, in terms of the practice of meditation, we extract our consciousness from everything outside. We forget the body. We forget thoughts. We forget feelings. We forget sensations. And we withdraw the consciousness back, back, back into its root, which is pure perception, no I, no personality, no self, the way we think of self. And then we begin to reflect upon that event. Let's say it's that promotion that our friend got. We then start to reflect on that, to visualize it, to imagine it. And the immediate reaction will be, we'll start to feel that ego surge up, that envy, that resentment, pride. That's when we have to start to separate, to keep the consciousness separate, to observe but not become involved. If we do that, the Divine Mother through the powers of the consciousness, can start to reflect new information to us, new understanding. It can come in an infinitude of forms. It's also helpful to look at that situation and imagine what we should have done and allow her to show us that, how we should behave, how we should act. If we persist in that activity, that battle with our own mind, we can gain new information. Then when that situation comes up, we can act appropriately. And what is the result? It has many aspects. In the first place, we have stopped harmful action because we've stopped allowing that envy to manipulate our behavior, our feelings, and our thoughts. We've started virtuous action by starting to listen to the guidance of God and to know how to act with happiness for our coworker who may really need that promotion, who might have kids, who might have a situation where they really need it. We should be happy for them, sincerely. And lastly, we've controlled our mind. This is the most beautiful part, because this gives us a foundation to go further, to make a step ahead. What happens in this combination of factors is that the vibration of our consciousness has changed. We have changed. It may be that no one else sees it, not even our spouse. It doesn't matter. God sees it. The laws of nature see it. We have produced new consequences, new results. We have changed our karma. Step by step, patiently, from situation to situation, by applying this simple key, we can change our future through our own action. Not by relying on any promise, not by relying on any insurance plan from our given religion, but by our own action. In this way, we start to experience what it means to be liberated. In that instance, that example of our coworker, we will experience something new. Our life will change. It might be a subtle change, and it will definitely be something that only we will feel. But we will feel something new, something different something nice. That is where the value starts to show. And that feeling is related with heaven, with nirvana. We start to bring it here and now. No longer depending on outside things, but bringing heaven now. From moment to moment, through the transformation of life. By transforming our experience from instant to instant. Then, when we die, our situation will be very different. 
our consciousness will vibrate in a totally different way. Life will be different. You see, in the Tibetan tradition, the great teacher uh, Padmasambhava said, the difference between samsara and nirvana is attention. It's an enigmatic statement at first glance. But when you really digest that, you can understand the meaning. If we learn to use attention, then we can learn to be in nirvana and beyond. And that really is the goal of Gnosis. We don't simply want to enter nirvana or heaven. We want to go beyond it. And here's why. Nirvana or heaven is very beautiful. It is a very beautiful experience to feel those qualities physically, consciously, emotionally, intellectually, to feel superior intellect or superior emotion. And when we vibrate in that level and we go out of our body, we can also experience nirvana or heaven. We can converse with the gods. We can perceive the underlying facts of existence for ourselves. And these are beautiful experiences. Yet, we can become attached. Easily attached. That's why in Gnosis, we seek to go beyond nirvana. To first save ourselves from hell and become free of it. But then, to become free of nirvana. To go beyond nirvana. To not be limited to nirvana either. But to go beyond. For us, this is incomprehensible because all we long for is the experience of nirvana. We just want happiness. We want peace. We want rest. We want a break from pain. We want out of the cage of our life. But let us remind you that getting out of the cage is only half the equation, half of the problem. And once out of the cage, there are new cages waiting to trap us that are just more subtle. But they are cages nonetheless. Do you have any questions? Um, related with hell and nirvana, <coughs> what can you tell us about uh, Hitler and Mahatma Gandhi in the political way? It's a good example. Good question. How can we understand the difference between Hitler and Gandhi politically in relation with heaven and hell? Well, that's a whole lecture. <laughs> the simple answer or the simple thing that comes to my mind is that each of those men utilized their energy and created certain results. Both of them had good intentions. Both. It's hard for us to understand that nowadays because we think Hitler is just pure evil. But he actually had good intentions. And in the beginning, he did a lot of good things for the German people. He made some good steps. I'm not saying he's a good person. What I'm saying is that intentions are irrelevant. Our intentions make no difference in the eyes of the law in the eyes of how nature manages energy. Listen, you can mean well, but if you shoot somebody and kill them, you've killed them. Simple. Even if it's accidental, the person is dead. You can't change that. And there's a consequence for that. So intentions mean nothing. In relation to these two men, we can see that both were managing a great deal of energy, using their consciousness to manage forces. And the only way they can do that is if they have knowledge. Gnosis. And each had a certain amount of knowledge. Neither one had the whole path. Neither one had the entire teaching. But they had enough to make a big impact. 
But here's the difference, as I see it, between these two. Gandhi relied on the guidance of God. Hitler did not. Gandhi humbled himself before his own divinity, and Hitler did not. This is an example that we can learn from. But going further, the question is specifically about politics. Politics and groups and movements are necessary for humanity because we receive guidance and instruction, and this is what we need. And groups and movements exist throughout the levels of nature, not just physically. There are groups and movements in hell, and there are groups and movements in heaven of beings who vibrate at those levels of nature, whose consciousness belongs in those realms, and they belong to certain groups. Yet no one goes and appoints themselves in charge of a certain group. That happens because of consequences, because of laws, because of cause and effect. Gandhi became Gandhi because he followed the steps of what he was guided to do through his heart, through his prayer, through his meditation, through his sense of what is right and wrong. Hitler, on the other hand, was guided by ambition. It might have been ambition that meant well for the Germans, but it was ambition. You see, Gandhi didn't have ambition. He had a simple goal, which was to liberate India. But in fact, he didn't want to be the guy. But he was put in that position and acted as best he could. Hitler wanted to be the guy. Does that answer your question? Any other questions? Yes. You talk about um, heaven and hell being psychological. Is it actual physical heaven and hell for, for those that uh, have uh, mastered the psychological aspect of heaven? I, I'm not sure I understand. Is there like a physical location? For heaven and hell? Right. For those that have mastered the uh, psychological level of heaven. Like, well... Sure. Heaven and hell are places as well. But the entrance to them is psychological. They are actual places. Dante wrote the Divine Comedy, which describes heaven and hell, because he went there. He experienced it. He saw it. And the same is true of initiates from every tradition. The Aztecs wrote about it. They taught about it. The Greeks, the Tibetans, the Hindus. Every tradition in the world has had people that have experienced the realities of heaven and hell. But that experience begins here physically. It begins here and now with who we are. And according to who we are, we can go there by that nature, by the very nature of who we are. Now I'll give you an example. The key is the consciousness, as I explained. The key to go to either direction, heaven or hell, is how we use the consciousness. If we awaken our consciousness and eliminate the ego, then nothing in us belongs to hell anymore, and we belong to heaven. We will naturally rise there. So it's the law of nature, cause and effect. On the other hand, if we awaken our consciousness but do not eliminate the ego, we will go to hell because the ego is still there and our consciousness is still in it. But awake. A person like that is a demon. A devil, a black magician, a necromancer, a seer even, or a diviner, as the Bible calls them. These are people who have powers. And they have powers because they have knowledge. But it's knowledge in hell. And these people are as common as weeds. They are everywhere. And they're very vigorous in spreading their teaching. So vigorous that once you learn about Gnosis, you will see their teaching in sitcoms, in movies, 
in television shows, in music, in magazines, but veiled. Not explicit, but it's always there using desire to entice us to have money, to have power, to have beauty, to have fame, to have recognition. And there are many, many millions who follow. And this is why Jesus said, narrow is the path to freedom and broad and easy is the path to destruction. It's very easy to awaken consciousness in Klippoth because more or less 97% of our consciousness is already there. If, if, a, if a ball is 97% hanging on the edge of a precipice, how easy is that to push over? And now how easy is it to push back the other way? It's not. And that's our situation right now. This is why we are very, very explicit and very, very detailed in how we express this doctrine. You must be precise. You cannot allow any misunderstanding or vagueness in your comprehension of how to practice because that a simple thing can lead you the wrong way. And usually the, those things that we just decide, oh, I don't believe that, that's where you're having a, a problem. Oh, I don't believe that. I don't accept that. Why? Based on what facts? This is the thing in Gnosis. We discard belief. We're not interested in belief. You can believe whatever you want, but if you seriously want to liberate your consciousness, you need to stop believing anything. Don't believe me. Don't believe Buddha. Don't believe Krishna, Jesus. Don't believe anyone, but trust your experience. However, don't trust your experience either. You have to test it again and again and again and measure it based in facts. That's why we give so many practices so that anyone can take these tools and put them to use. But if you don't use them, it's your will. It's up to you. <laughs> Any other questions? What is the difference between mind and consciousness? That too could be a whole lecture. The difference between mind and consciousness. Well, we use those terms a little bit interchangeably sometimes. In general, we say mind comes from the word manas, which is a Sanskrit word. And manas refers to superior and inferior manas, which are natsa and tiferet. These are aspects of psyche. If you get specific, that's what mind refers to. But in actual reality, when you study Hinduism in particular, or even Buddhism, they talk about how everything that's manifested is condensed mind. And that refers to consciousness. So mind and consciousness, it's hard to discriminate them as two totally separate things because they're very related, right? For example, in, uh, in, in, in Gnosis and in Buddhism, we use a very important term called bodhicitta. Bodhicitta means, in literal translation from Sanskrit, awakening mind, right? But that citta, which is mind in that word, does not mean mind and intellect. It means mind in consciousness. And that refers to all these levels, which are all psychological and which we have inside. So there's different ways of applying the term is what I'm getting at. The, the basic place to start in this teaching is don't confuse intellect with consciousness. Those are different. The word mind can have a lot of subtleties. Intellect is here. It is that thought process of, oh, I'm doing this and that, and here I am, and I'm going here and there, and i got to do this, and I... Blah, 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 that on and on thing of chatter is intellect. More questions? No? Okay, thank you.
To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Amen.